Let's talk briefly about two infectious agents that aren't exactly viruses. And if we struggle to decide whether viruses are alive or not, we're going to struggle even more to know what to do with viroids and prions. Viroids are RNA molecules that are infectious. So it's similar to a virus in that there are single-stranded RNA viruses out there, but it's different from a virus <clears throat> in that, uh, as far as we can tell, there's no genes coded on the RNA, and there's certainly no protein coat, no capsid, uh, that's protecting this little RNA molecule. It tends to be very short and circular, and there are regions of reverse complementarity, like you see in this drawing here, that cause it to form what we call secondary structure. So you get base pairing of regions that cause it to form uh, essentially a rod-like shape rather than saying, staying single-stranded. As far as we know so far, viroids are limited to plant diseases. There are currently no known viroid diseases among humans, but I wanted to bring this up in case you hear the term. Remember oid, that uh, suffix in science tells us sorta kinda. So it's sorta kinda a virus, but you can see hopefully how it's not exactly a virus, missing some pretty important features that a virus would have. So viroids, infectious RNA molecules cause diseases in plants. <clears throat> now let's talk about one that can cause diseases in, in humans, and these are prions. Prions are proteins that are infectious. So we're getting really simple here. There's no capsid. There's not even nucleic acid involved. So we have something infectious that can actually replicate itself, that has no nucleic acid, no capsid, no cellular structure, nothing to it that speaks of life, and yet it can replicate itself or direct its own replication. We'll see how that happens in a minute. So these are infectious proteins that cause disease in humans and animals. And uh, I, I liken them to zombies, at least what I've seen from zombies in the movies. And hopefully that'll make sense as we look at how prions um, spread and create other prions. <clears throat> so we've got a protein in our brain primarily called cellular PRP. And it got the name PRP uh, from prion protein, right? We understood that there's a healthy version of this that plays a very important role in the brain in uh, nerve signaling and a variety of other things apparently. So imagine the healthy version of cellular PRP is sort of like Benedict Cumberbatch, all cleaned up and looking good at the Oscars or the Emmys or wherever he's at. Now there's another version of the exact same protein that we call prion PRP. This is the zombie version of the prion protein. So on the left, you got the healthy cellular PRP, plays an important role in brain function. <clears throat> the exact same amino acid primary sequence can actually fold into a different three-dimensional shape, into different secondary and tertiary structure, and be stable under those other conditions. When it folds into that other shape, we call it prion, and it's the zombie form. It's the form that's unhealthy. So imagine you had a protein that's supposed to be helping with nerve signaling, etc., and now all of a sudden it can't do that anymore. So you lose an important piece to the health and function, the biochemistry of the brain. You're thinking, well, who cares if one of them happens to do this? Here's the problem. <clears throat> There's two ways that cellular PRP can become prion PRP. Okay, Cellular PRP can spontaneously misfold into prion PRP. Fortunately, there are mechanisms in place to make sure that doesn't happen, and so it's extremely rare for it to spontaneously misfold into prion PRP. The more common way to get prion PRP is for another prion protein to come into physical contact with a healthy cellular PRP. Okay, so we've got the prion protein, the misfolded zombie version of the protein on the right, and it comes into contact with your healthy brain PRP. It will actually rearrange it and refold it into the prion form. That's where it's sort of like zombies, right? From what I've seen in the movies, <clears throat> it's for somebody to become a zombie, they get attacked by another zombie. And so when they get attacked by another zombie, then they become a zombie. Now you got two zombies running around, turning normal, healthy Benedict Cumberbatch people into Benedict Cumberbatch zombies. <clears throat> so once you've got one that is prion PRP, either spontaneously or as we'll see on the next slide, um, through consumption of contaminated, um, uh, contaminated tissues, then 
uh, all of a sudden you've got this chain reaction, so to speak. And one prion becomes two, and those two go out and they attack other prions and become four, and those four go out and attack other cellular PRP, making more prions, until pretty soon all your cellular PRP is completely misfolded, and your brain is scrambled, and you're nothing but a zombie, and eventually you die. The diseases that prions cause are called spongiform encephalopathies because upon examination after the death of the victim, the brain looks real spongy and mushy. Here's some examples you may have heard of. Mad cow disease, also called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, VCJD, is a human form of this. Scrapie, uh, used to be common in sheep, don't know if it still is. Kuru, uh, was a form of a prion disease that was only seen in Papua New Guinea among cannibal populations. And so they'd kill their enemies and eat part of them ritualistically, and apparently the brain was part of that. And if that person had uh, Kuru, then the person who ate it, now their brain tissues are going to come into contact with the prion PRP, and they're going to have Kuru as well, and the cycle would continue. Um, taught them to quit eating each other's brains, and from what I understand, Kuru is not all that common anymore, if at all. <clears throat> Chronic wasting disease is actually not all that uncommon. We see it especially in deer and elk. Hunters are often warned to keep an eye out for chronic wasting disease in animals that they've killed, because if they come into contact with the body fluids, or they eat the tissues, I suppose they wouldn't eat the brain, but it makes sense that these, uh, these prion proteins could escape the brain and get into other tissues. If those hunters eat them, then those hunters can actually come down with uh, a, a prion disease uh, directly from the deer and elk uh, tissue. So how's it transmitted? By, primarily by ingesting infected tissues. Um, there have been examples of transplants of infected tissues uh, with, uh, that were carrying prions. Or contact between infected tissues and openings such as someone who's preparing meat. Let's say someone kills a deer and they're busy cleaning the deer. They've got a cut on their hand while they're doing it. They're covered in blood, so they don't even notice they've got a cut on their hand. It's very possible they could pick up the, uh, the prion. So these are the, the viroids, which affect plants, and the prions, which affect various animals, including humans. Learn them well.